Hey guys, what's up? Cassie West here. So today I wanted to give my review of the documentary called I Survive, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Most of the kids that grew up with this are now in their late 20s and 30s. We can really see the fruits of how this book's influence ended up impacting people's lives. And I can kind of go into the influence that this mindset had on my life and has ultimately resulted in a lot of Christians who are single, some of which have never even had a relationship, completely clueless and now realizing that they'll they probably will never get to have a family or children or anything like that. So I'm glad that he made this documentary. Without further ado, let's get started. We're all searching for true love. The question is, where are we going to find it? It seems these days that people are looking for love in all the wrong places. There are over 3,000 dating services in America today. Hey! <laughs> How you doing? It kind of rocked everybody's world. You were not qualified. You are nuts! This thing's filled with legalism. I care about purity, I care about holiness. Like, what, what are you doing? There was a guy who just wanted to put God first. I need to take a journey of asking hard questions and letting the answers lead me wherever they will. Obviously the whole book isn't wrong. Obviously we are to want to find another person who we can be equally yoked with. And these are very basic biblical concepts of marrying someone that you're equally yoked with and waiting for marriage. So he's saying, I, I do not reject those concepts, but the solutions that I provided in my book to fornication and pain and STDs and unplanned pregnancies and all these things that were happening in modern culture, I provided a solution that is not in the Bible. And then it was presented to people as biblical truth. I walked into a room, I kid you not, you can't even make this up. It was guys on this side of the room, girls on that side of the room. ask someone out for a cup of coffee unless you know they're the one that you're going to be with for the rest of your life. And it almost put this extra layer of pressure or shame. The people that go on Tinder, they might have sex the first time they meet each other. I was so afraid to kiss her. For you personally, you didn't kiss your wife before marriage. My book made people feel like they had to do things a certain way. And I regret that. If your first courtship didn't work, courtship wouldn't work for you. Well, that person gave their heart away. These purity proms where girls are given a rose with all the petals ripped off. If you don't have your virginity to give, you're like this rose without petals. When there's a hyper emphasis on anything, it becomes this weird sort of monster that it was never meant to be. They would say things like, Jesus is the only guy you need until God brings you a fleshy one. My book started with maybe some of the wrong questions. There were things in it that were true. It didn't press down into the really important issues, what sex really means before God. We are meant to be passionate towards one another, but it's not just the passion of the narrow understanding of sexuality. In this whole process, there are a lot of people that want me to just throw out everything they want me to throw out all the Christianity. They want me to apologize for teaching what I think the Bible has always taught. And so I wrestle with seeing ways in which my book didn't help people, and does that mean I was wrong in these massive ways? We both didn't know what we were dealing with. I did things right, and marriage was a mess from the day the vows were exchanged. My thinking has changed since I wrote I Kissed Dating Goodbye. I want to say to anyone who was hurt by my book, on one hand telling people you better wait until marriage to have sex, and then 
on the other hand, telling them not to be in a relationship. You know how you're able to wait until marriage to have sex? By getting married young. And you know how you get married young? By dating. It just seems so contradictory. Like you're you're not giving people anywhere to go. You're not giving them anything to do. The only solution to their problem you're saying is wrong. Like what if people don't live in a place that has a good church or something like that? Um, it would be extremely uh, beneficial for them to go to a Christian dating website or, you know, try to meet people through groups and forums online uh, that are like-minded. Why, why would that be bad? If anything, that's, that's amazing. That's a blessing. That makes it so much easier for Christians with the exact same values and beliefs to find each other. Um, so he's literally condemning the exact tools necessary um, for people to live by these biblical commands. And I can say just it, even me going to church throughout high school and middle school, this was talked about all the time. Why would this other guy want you when you've already given part of your heart to this other guy because you went on like four dates with him? So the movie starts out with a reenactment of the opening scenario that Joshua Harris wrote in his book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, where um, there's a bride and a groom at the altar um, and they're about to say their vows, but then every woman that he's ever dated comes up onto the altar with him and he realizes that because he's had past relationships, he's not fully able to give his heart to this woman. And he cheated her out of a husband or something. It's bad. Like, first of all, that is such an anti-Christian mindset where your whole past is just drug around behind you. I thought the whole concept of Christianity is you know, putting behind those things which are behind and looking forward, you know, to high calling. I mean, it's bad enough having to go on dates, break up, this and that happen. It's bad enough, but then being told that, you know, according to God, you're now garbage because of that. I didn't even start dating till my early 20s because of this kind of nonsense. So stuff that I should have learned at like 16 and 17, like just basic ways of interacting with men that I, literally didn't know like basic social skills that I did not have um, that I should have had as a teenager I didn't get until I was in my early 20s um, and that wasn't doing me any favors that didn't do anything I mean if anything that could have potentially cost me my ability to get married and have children I mean if I hadn't if I hadn't wised up when I did I would have missed the window of meeting my husband. I, I wouldn't have the kids that I have, you know, the house that we have, the life that we have now. And it's just like, it makes me really angry because I really, I really love my life. And it really makes me angry that, um, just this kind of thinking, not, not this book in particular. Cause like I said, I don't think this is Joshua Harris's fault, but this way of thinking almost robbed all that from me. And it took him a long time to realize like, no, there are fundamentalist Christians who disagree with me. There are people who loved my book who now say it caused them a lot of damage in their life. Um, you know, it took him just meeting enough people to finally have to realize and face the fact that, no, these aren't all liberal atheists that I can just dismiss. These are real people that have actual biblical, um, issues with what I'm saying. I love when he talks to this guy, Curtis, who's now a pastor of his own church. Um, and he got saved, you know, right out of prison and started going to church. And he said that, you know, he was in Joshua Harris's youth group and he started talking to this girl one day. And afterward, this guy came up to him and was like, you were talking to her for too long you really need to guard her heart. You know, at first he just thought it was cultural um, because he had been from prison in the streets and all that kind of stuff. So he was like, I don't even know what normal social stuff is anyway. But then after a while, he was like, no, they actually believe this. They, they actually think like you shouldn't even really talk to anybody or get to know anybody. 
to him as a new Christian. And a lot of times new Christians can see things that um, older Christians or people that have been saved longer can't see because they're so enmeshed in the culture. Whereas the new Christian is just looking at things, um, you know, from the actual biblical beliefs because they haven't been brainwashed by all the wrong, by all the wrong cultural beliefs yet. Um, and so him as an outsider looking in was like, wow, that seems really superficial. What's wrong with feminism and sleeping around and Tinder and all these things that people, you know, that are all these conservatives say is bad. It's the fact that it's superficial, you know, it's based on looks. It's not looking at people as human beings. It's looking at them as an object by swinging so far the opposite direction, turned it to where well, if I can't even talk to somebody unless I know I'm super serious about them, what's the result of that? You're only going to be talking to the most attractive people, the people who from the exterior look the most appealing to you because you're not even able to get to know people. So then he interviews some people who were supporters of courtship until they figured out on their own, oh, this doesn't actually work. And so this guy was like, you know what, I'm just going to write a post about this because if 10,000 girls see it, then, you know, maybe I can ask someone out for coffee and they won't think I'm trying to propose to them. Him and some other people that felt the same way and had experienced, had similar experiences said that irony, you know, ironically, <laughs> it resulted in a lot of very similar problems that people have with promiscuity. But this was saying, you know, if you just simply ask someone out for coffee. If you go on one date with somebody, you know, you might as well have just had sex with them. You know, if your very first courtship doesn't work, then courtship just won't work at all for you because everyone in that community now says, oh, well, I can't ask Sally out because she's already given her heart to Joe. She went to coffee with him three times. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insane. That's the same thing as back in the day when if someone slept with a woman, she would get a scarlet letter and no one in the town would, would date her after that. It actually just created this just horrific problem where you couldn't even get to know anyone or care about other human beings without being perceived as some sort of promiscuous person, some sort of ungodly person, some sort of person who isn't a whole person because you've already given your heart away. You haven't given your heart away. That's not a, that's not a thing. The reality is because of this absolute BS, the rates of marriage um, within the church, within the Christian demographic has dropped significantly. Now those people that were, you know, my same age back when all this was, was coming about and these things were becoming movements. Now they're 30 years old, single, 35 years old, single, um, you know, still no marriage, still no kids. And I thought the whole point of what everyone tells you about promiscuity is that, oh, well, you don't want to do that because then you could um, end up ruining prospects for marriage or end up a single parent or, but it's like you are sitting here supporting a philosophy that would end up with the exact same results. Um, and not that we should obey or do the right thing because of potential results. You should do the right thing because it's the right thing and it's what God wants you to do. At the same time, there are still things that are damaging and not damaging and beliefs that are pushed as gospel truth and as biblical truth that are actually lies. And because they're lies, they've caused people a great deal of harm and um, loneliness. This idea that as long as you follow God, your life will turn out great. That's not something that's taught in the Bible. You will find joy and happiness in the gospel and in Jesus and in God. But um, there is absolutely no guarantee that all your dreams will come true. All your desires will come true. Um, Sometimes God has a much different plan for us and it just doesn't involve what we think is best for our lives. And he says that that lie is actually why his book sold so well. Because people want to believe a lie. They want to believe everything is that simple. They want to believe, oh, if I do X, Y, Z, then I'll get this, this, and this. That's, that's a pretty easy idea to sell. How easy is it to sell the idea that you could live your life in devotion to God 
and end up alone. You could end up abandoned. You could end up single your whole life. You could end up, you know, in an unhappy marriage. Like how, how, how well would that book sell? The book that said the truth. And it wouldn't. And that's why a book that said the exact opposite ended up becoming a worldwide bestseller that sold over a million copies. Because people want to believe lies and they want to believe that everything can be reduced down to these simple, simple, simple solutions. And they just can't. So then he gets into an interview with a woman who's talking about all these, you know, analogies that Christians have used um, over the years to promote purity and virginity. And one of those is, oh, look at this rose. And then they peel off all the um, petals and they're like, wow, if you are not a virgin on your wedding day, then you are like this rose. You're totally useless. Um, or, uh, you know, the pastor will get up on stage and chew a piece of gum and then spit it out and say, does anyone else want this gum? No, of course not, because it's been used before. So if you have sex before marriage, you're like this chewed up piece of gum. I mean, what does that say to someone who got saved later in life, who got saved as like a 25 year old woman or a 30 year old woman or man or whatever, who obviously if they're part of like the normal culture before then have more than likely had sex before. What does that say to someone who was raped as a child or molested as a child? What message are you saying? Because the Bible says that that person has no fault in them. So the Bible doesn't say that you are useless or of no use to anyone or of no value to anyone if you're no longer a virgin. Um, so why is this purity culture promoting that? No, you should stay pure before marriage because you want to do the right thing and because you want to make sure that you honor him and other people. It's, it's not so that you can fulfill some status. It's not because otherwise you're going to be some useless, pathetic, worthless person. Because that's just not true. But then there are also people who are absolute atheists, completely asexual, or just terribly unattractive, and they're a virgin, but it's just because either they can't find anyone to have sex with, or they just have no desire for their own personal reasons, like they're asexual. That doesn't have anything to do with them being some virtuous, wonderful person. It's not like, oh, that person is more valuable than the saved Christian who wants to live a godly life who has had mistakes in the past. So it just has this disgusting way of viewing people. You know, I've made a mistake, but I can repent and move on from it. Instead of creating an environment where people feel comfortable to feel that way and to think that way, instead these people are like, wow, I guess I'm useless and worthless and no one will ever want me now anyway, so I might as well just go have sex with whoever I want. Might as well just give up. Who cares? So it's very damaging and it actually results in less purity because it's not a biblical concept. So I like at the end where this girl points out that yes, of course, there were a million things that were told to her that shouldn't have been told to her. A lot of the advice in that book should not have been told to her. It was bad advice. A lot of the things that the people in her church said to her should not have been said because it was bad or discouraging or caused her to stumble where maybe she wouldn't have if she had been supported or had a better peer group. Um, there were things that her parents did that they probably shouldn't have done. But ultimately, Jesus is bigger. He is bigger than all their mistakes, all your mistakes, and he's still here for you. He's still there for you. I really like that kind of ending message of the documentary because I agree. I mean, what else can you expect? Obviously throughout your life, you're going to be getting bad advice. And just because someone's Christian or a pastor or whatever doesn't mean that they're perfect and everything that comes out of their mouth is going to be good. So I guess the next time that this happens and someone who is 20 years old and knows nothing about life writes a book. I hope that we as a uh, Christian community have learned enough to know, 
you shouldn't necessarily take everything that they say and run with it as though it's gospel truth. You know, especially when the book is about relationships and that person isn't even married. I know that me personally, it wasn't just this book, but an entire culture around it in Christian spheres throughout the 90s and early 2000s that had just these really weird stigmas and ideas about courtship and dating and blah 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 that actually caused a lot of damage and as a result people are just not getting married at all or you know just hitting a certain age like you know staying a virgin staying a virgin until they hit like 24 25 26 and they just can't take it anymore just end up with somebody that isn't even a christian at all i think that a lot of that could be prevented if um there was also, in addition to encouraging, you know, purity and abstinence, also encouraging people to date and to marry young. So then you don't have to use self-control. You don't have to be worried about all this. You're, you're married and can be done with it. If I could go back, I probably would have started dating younger. I would have actually sat down and thought seriously about what I want in a spouse, what kind of wife I want to be. You know, obviously I wouldn't go back and change anything because then it might not have been my husband and my exact kids. But let's say that, you know, if, if all that could still be the same, it would have been really nice to have found my husband sooner. It would have been really nice to have been ready for him sooner. Um, but there were just a lot of things that I had to learn because I was just very delayed um, because I just I didn't even start dating until I was like 21 or 22 years old just because I thought it was a sign of weakness. I thought it was a sign of someone who isn't confident, that it was bad, it means that you're not really a strong Christian. I just had the dumbest ideas in my head and it ended up not serving any good benefit whatsoever. I am glad that there is forgiveness. I am glad that um, not everything is just based on our past and we are able to look forward. So for any of you guys who grew up late 90s, um, early 2000s, and um, were kind of around this never kiss dating goodbye, courtship not dating culture, if you have any stories or similar experiences or totally different experiences, let me know. Because I do find this fascinating, just how it really impacted the culture and oddly resulted in less marriage and less children within Christian circles, which was supposedly the whole point of these ideas to begin with. So I just, I, f I find it just this very bizarre phenomenon, um, these really weird mindsets and hangups that for whatever reason particularly affected our generation. Please leave your comments below. I will read them. I am really interested. And you guys have a great rest of your night. Bye.